Okay, now I know it's been a long trip through the first two theories of personality, especially because the first two theories of personality, the psychodynamic approach and the phenomenological approach, have virtually no scientific value today. We did have to cover them in detail, however, simply because mass media systems constantly present both the Freudian and the hierarchy of needs processes as the way in which modern psychology presents its facts. And that is simply not true. No part of modern scientific psychology engages Freud in any manner or the phenomenological approach in any manner, except for, in the phenomenological approach, the processes that Rogers developed through scientific work, which was genuineness, acceptance, and empathy. And those three things are very specific to clinical work. In terms of underlying principles and understanding how basic psychological processes operate, Freud and Maslow give us absolutely nothing. But always remember, you live in a world in which the incorrect information is always presented as fact. And you, as a psychology student, will constantly see this stuff on television and you will always meet individuals that are not specifically trained in a psychology program to say things to you like, you know, why, why do psychologists study Freud or, you know, what's the purpose of the, you know, self-esteem and so forth. And people will tell you it's all bullshit, but you'll know that it's not bad, but they'll, they'll be irritated by it because they've even thought about these concepts themselves and they don't seem to make sense. And they've decided that they don't work, you know, that the, that the whole idea doesn't add up. Um, and you'll be there to agree with those individuals. Um, and you'll also be in a better position to understand where the nonsense from television comes from and how it gets repackaged. Because not all the Freudian or phenomenological aspects are always presented from the place where they came from. They are slowly becoming repackaged in different ways so that you have to be aware of the process that's being presented and know that it's just being given a new name. Because for the standpoint of the media, these ridiculous theories have value, uh, entertainment value. And the entertainment value pays off for the media organization in terms of higher profits by exposing people to more advertisement time. You cannot fall prey to this nonsense. This gets us to the final uh, two theories, which are actually of value, the social learning theory and the trait theory. Social learning theory, as we mentioned a long time ago, is related to nurture or the role of how the environment helps develop personality. And the trait approach is going to be related to how genetics or other types of basic biological processes manage personality characteristics. These two aspects fit standard operating procedure of modern psychology. That is, in the broadest sense, all human behavior is affected by both biology and the environment. And these two theories, social learning theory and trait theory, represent those two components, the role of the environment and the role of biology. They are not conflicting theories. They are complementary to each other. At one time in the 50s, social learning theorists and trait theorists would, would argue about who was right. But at this point, it's clear that both theoretical approaches are needed to produce one total, fully functioning understanding of what personality is supposed to be. And again, don't forget that personality is still a construct, a very, very large construct. And so uh, depending upon how you define it will affect the specific ways in which you study it and how you're actually going to create a concept of a, of a personality trait. Now in social learning theory, 
most of personality is theorized to come from conditioning principles. That is, if you are looking at how the environment manages the development of personality, you do go to the most underlying principles that are always there. Conditioning principles. That is the principles of association. And the string of associations that occur throughout your life, depending upon how rewards and punishments are set up and how, how associations are formed through Pavlovian operant conditioning techniques, establish the patterns of behavior that you exhibit. If those, if those patterns of, of behavior are really well established over the course of years or even possibly decades, they may become very familiar, comfortable patterns for you, in which case they would be referred to as traits because they would become patterns of behavior that you're comfortable with. And, and note that note that one specific aspect too. A trait in the field of personality is nothing more than a pattern of behavior that lasts for a very long period of time in your life. That's all a trait is. And that's what personality theorists generally do. Of all the things in psychology, they are specifically focused on anything that generally lasts over the course of decades in your pattern of behavior. So you're introverted or extroverted, you're an athlete, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're advanced intellectually in math, mathematics. Um, if you're looking for a pattern that is there for long, long periods of time, then that's going to be called a trait. Anything that changes rapidly, not considered a trait. So there's this selective attention on the uh, standpoint of personality theorists to focus on things that last a long time. And so from the standpoint of social learning theory, you're usually looking at patterns of behavior that are established early in life under a fairly regimented, uh, repeatable process so that a person exhibits a behavior, becomes rewarded, does it again and again and again and again over the course of maybe the first 20 years of their life, and it becomes a characteristic pattern that they like to uh, engage in, and so then they wind up doing it. Now, one of the aspects of social learning theory that have actually played out very well is the recognition of something called locus of control. Locus of control is a perceptual aspect. And remind yourself of this issue from the sensation of perception chapter. I told you over and over again that between what actually happens in the world and what you perceive happens in the world, your perception is always more important because you behave on your perceptions, not you don't always behave based on how things are actually operating in the environment, but you behave based upon what you believe is actually happening, what you perceive is happening. And this aspect of locus of control is entirely a perceptual variable. It's not sensory, it is perceptual. And you need to be aware of that framework as you go into this topic. Now, in terms of locus of control, what the perception is, is that a person will either perceive that the behavior they exhibit actually does influence the environment in ways that they want it to, in which case you would call that an internal locus of control, or a person exhibits behavior and they don't find that what they do actually has any influence on the environment or their ability to get through life, and that would be generally referred to as an external locus of control. Internal and external locus of control are on a continuum. Internal on one side, external on the other side. And realistically, a person doesn't pick one point for the entire scale and say that, you know, they're modestly internal for all things. It simply doesn't work that way. You have to select a specific pattern of behavior and then ask the person whether or not they're internal or external. Okay, evaluate the person, not, not ask them. You'll evaluate whether or not they're internal or external on a particular pattern. So a person might be very internal with respect to some characteristics and very external with respect to other characteristics. And that is completely normal. So it's not a global measure of locus of control. It's a measure of locus of control with respect to a particular pattern of behavior. 
Look at some of the examples I give you for internal locus of control. Um, things like the friends you choose, for example, which is something that you very well may have a lot of control over. Not necessarily because in some cases your parents may force you to be friends with certain people uh, so that you stay within your own community, for example. Uh, but in many cases, most of us get to choose uh, whatever friends we want. Which job you train for, which college you decide to attend, whether you decide not even to go to college, who you decide to marry. For most of us, these are things that are actually under our control. Of course, this is not the case in all scenarios, but it is in uh, most cases in North America. External locus of control. Trying to make things uh, somewhat similar for, uh, for comparison's sake. Uh, instead of looking at the friend you choose, look at the family you were born into, right? You have no control over the family you were born into. And if you think, oh my God, my family members are a bunch of knuckleheads. You're just stuck with them, right? I mean, you could walk away, but that doesn't change the fact that your brother's a knucklehead and your mom's a knucklehead and your dad's a knucklehead. They're still knuckleheads. You're still related to them. But even, even if you move across town or move to another country, you're still related to them and you have no control over uh, that relationship. And so that would place a person... Uh, clearly in the realm of an external locus of control. The neighborhood you were raised in, most likely related to your parents' decisions, the historical time period you live in, completely, uh, completely random, right? Your parents had a child, that child was you, you happen to be born now. The, pre <laughs> the presence of contagious diseases, <laughs> That's been, that has been um, in this slide for years. And uh, with the COVID-19 lockdown, um, I just realized it's just perfect. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. You will have as a story for the rest of your life the presence of COVID-19 and uh, the lockdown and the fact that you had to take classes um, online and so forth as an issue that was related to something that you have no control over. The disease is out there, the virus is out there, it's spreading around, and um, it is completely out of your control. Now, in terms of internal locus of control, an individual with an internal locus of control tends to exert more self-control um, for the things that they believe, that they perceive that they can actually control. And uh, the concept of self-control itself is defined in a, a, a very simple way. It is the ability to delay gratification. And what that actually means is when you have a choice between an immediate reward or a usually a much larger reward that you have to wait for, um, there's a choice between taking what's small now or something larger after a period of time. And under circumstances like that, the person with an internal locus of control usually picks the larger reward even though they may have to wait or work toward it over time. In fact, the, uh, the basic way in which self-control is actually um, measured is by uh, traditionally uh, using laboratory animals. And so, for example, let's suppose you had a rat um, and you could give a rat between a choice between pressing a bar and getting one pellet of food or pressing a bar and getting five pellets of food. Now, if that, was a, if that was a basic setup, the rat would always press the bar and get the five pellets of food. Nobody would expect anything different uh, to occur under circumstances like that. But what if you took the five pellets of food reward and you pushed it back by a minute? So for example, you could get one pellet of food now, or you can get five pellets of food a minute from now. Would the rat choose the five pellets of food having to wait a minute or would it just take the one pellet now? And in fact, uh, this is essentially the way that you compare the relative strengths of rewards between uh, two different reinforcers. You take, you take the reward 
you make one small, one large, and then the larger one always gets degraded by pushing it out in time so that there's a longer and longer duration that has to be waded, uh, waded through before you can actually obtain it. The point at which the subject chooses the larger reward that they have to wait for and the smaller, more immediate reward, once they um, balance out at about 50-50, that's the measure of the strength of the two rewards. That you can say that a uh, the larger reward, like a five pellets degraded by 30 minutes, is equal to an immediate reward of only one pellet. In fact, that basis, uh, even though we're not going to go through the details of this, that's actually the basis by which you can gauge the strength of addictive substances to, so that you can compare them. It's like if you were to ask, what's more addictive, nicotine or alcohol, alcohol or cocaine, cocaine or heroin? Um, you can actually quantify these systems. In fact, it, it, this kind of work actually has been done, um, starting with psychologists back in the 1960s, and then uh, more so uh, moving over to the field of pharmacology almost entirely now. And all of this work is actually related. You know, this, this work on drugs and, um, and lab animals is not unrelated to the internal locus of control because the same process to evaluate self-control for a human being is used uh, for lab animals uh, when you're testing uh, addictive substances. So for people with an internal locus of control, when they perceive that their efforts actually play out um, positively for themselves, they are more likely to engage in schedules, um, to plan their day, stick to their schedule, um, to actively choose goals and to systematically work toward them. All of those patterns of behavior indicate an internal locus of control for that particular characteristic. And in fact, uh, one note here that I'm going to say, which we're going to come back to in a couple of slides, is that individuals who have an internal locus of control are much less likely to become depressed or to develop anxiety disorders. Now, an individual with an external locus of control would tend to give up on things more soon. Uh, a person with an external locus of control would be more likely to give up quicker than a person with an internal locus of control. And again, look at the context for it. With an external locus of control, if you don't perceive that your behavior actually results in positive outcomes for yourself, then you're more likely to simply give up because why are you even trying? Because your efforts don't actually pay off. And in fact, this is actually... Uh, a connection starting from around the 1980s that has been made in which people who are clinically depressed have been found to have been exposed to a series of negative events that they have difficulty managing. And if those events are very significant or if many of them occur, oftentimes the individual winds up with a clinical depression and then winds up in therapy. Uh, so the connection here between depression and learned helplessness is one we originally made back in the learning chapter. And at this point, I do recommend that you go back to the learning chapter on one of the last pages of the chapter itself to reread about one page worth of information on learn helplessness. Because the connection between the process of learn helplessness and depression, which is actually made in the learning chapter, comes back here. For individuals that are exposed to events outside their control that are very aversive, that they're unable to stop from occurring, oftentimes leads them to feel depressed. And of course, everybody's different, so there's going to be a wider range. Some people don't, don't become depressed very easily. Other people can become depressed. But this exposure to 
uncontrolled of revert this exposure to uncontrolled aversive events is a setting factor for depression it doesn't have to cause depression because some people are more resilient to it but if you're looking for depression this would be the way to generate it now the term self-control has been used in a, in a lot of different ways it sometimes in a general social sense is actually used um, in a similar manner as the word willpower uh, but willpower just to be technical this is kind of more of an academic issue um, for clarity of the uh, terminology willpower is the original term that was used based on the early 20th century thinking which was stating everything was based off of genetics all right so we go back to darwin 1859 comes out with the theory of evolution all your physical and psychological characteristics are based on genetics right that's the theory so when in the late 1800s early 1900s when people were talking about how well could a person control themselves they used the term willpower willpower specifically re was reflected in the degree of your genetic control of your ability to control yourself and the concept was applied in cases like alcoholism so for example let's say it was 1915 and you are a medical doctor uh, working with um, detoxifying um, alcoholics and you notice that you know 75 percent of the people that go through detox wind up going back to drinking um, if you try and try and do all the therapies that you possibly can and some individuals still go back to drinking what you wind up saying is they don't have enough willpower right and th and that's being stated just the way it would come from a genetic standpoint you don't have enough of the underlying genetic stuff that would let you control yourself therefore you could be forced through detox but you will just go back to drinking again that's the concept of willpower but willpower is a is a topic that has been dropped we don't use willpower anymore as a term because willpower turns out not to be correct your ability to control yourself is now referred to as self-control because self-control as I've shown you in the previous slide back here self-control is defined as your ability to delay gratification and that process is primarily determined by the degree of environmental events the training that actually takes place in fact the one of the characteristics of this whole process that plays itself out is is that it seems self-control is highly weighted toward environmental control and much less toward biological control that to say that another way you could say reasonably accurately almost anybody could control themselves for almost any normal pattern as long as they try so there's nothing that you can't really do if you don't actually put in the effort and uh, that you know that sounds like a very positive uh, kind of statement out psychology and you know because because it's kind of almost kind of a positive cheerleading thing a lot of people might just call it BS it sounds like that but the facts from the experimentation indicate that self-control is much more related to um, training rather than biology and as a result if there's something that you can't do you should uh, you should be able to train yourself to be able to get it done whatever it actually is getting off a of heroin um, you know stopping smoking studying more often exercising more often practicing more polite behavior whatever it might actually be that you've decided you want to do you might have difficulty but in a standard operating procedure if you just break it down into small pieces and accomplish each of the smaller pieces bit by bit by bit and work your way through 
you should be able to overcome your, you should be able to meet your goals. This gets us into the final theoretical approach, the trade approach. Now, as we mentioned before, the trade approach is, of course, related to genetics. And uh, the trade approach, if you notice here, started in 1930s. But what kind of genetic work was actually being done in the 1930s? Very little. In fact, you have to go back to around the 1920s, maybe, where you'll, which is about the time you'll start to see genetics labs. And genetics labs can't do genetic work, genetics work. Um, DNA is not identified as a thing until the 1950s. So what could you be doing in a genetics lab in the 1920s? Well, artificial selection, that's the primary thing. Uh, you take insects like fruit flies that have short lifespans relative to yourself and you breed them under certain uh, circumstances to either uh, breed them so that they lose their wings or develop spots or or cold adapted or warm adapted, uh, whatever it might actually be. Most of the early genetic w genetics work uh, during this time is actually taking place through the process of artificial selection, not any work specifically related to biochemical pathways, which is what genetics looks like today. When this trade approach gets started, it gets started by a fellow named Gordon Allport. And oddly enough, there's a kind of a background story that you see uh, in this chapter. Um, I had told you that Sigmund Freud was very popular in the early 20th century, but by the 1950s, scientific psychology has completely written them off because they couldn't find a consistent, clear evidence for any of his theories. During the, uh, during the 40s up until the early 50s, uh, you wind up with Abraham Maslow, who creates the hierarchy of needs, right? the entire phenomenological approach, specifically because he does not like Freud's work and he wants to create a model that contrasts with Freud. Gordon Allport goes to Europe, meets Sigmund Freud, and while he's there, imposing on Freud's time a little bit, Freud accuses Allport of being mentally ill. Allport gets mad, comes back to the United States, thinks about what happened, and, and comes to the conclusion that there's no way in the 10 or 15 minutes that he was with Freud that Freud could have accurately diagnosed Allport with any type of mental disorder. And that leads Allport to conclude that Freud himself is not doing very good work. As a result, Allport specifically starts working on the trade approach. And I'm going to say this in a slightly separate way. This is the second time in this chapter that a researcher has created a separate model of personality specifically because they did not like Sigmund Freud. The first was Abraham Maslow, and the second one is Gordon Allport. That's remarkable. That's how much controversy swirled around the Freudian approach back in the early 20th century that researchers were actually creating theories that were just specifically designed to uh, counter Freud. Now, Allport believed in a trade approach, uh, the idea that there's some underlying biological process that would lead to personality characteristics being developed. But of course, there is no capacity back in the 1930s to do genetics work, uh, genetic work that we would uh, do today. So Allport thinks creatively and he realizes if there are personality characteristics that have been bred in over time through natural selection, they should be represented in language because as the personality characteristics develop in the human population, human populations in all languages should reflect those personality characteristics in the names that they have for, pa for patterns of behavior. 
And so what Allport does is he goes to an American English dictionary and he looks for as many words as he possibly can find that are related to personality. And he finds approximately 18,000 words. He reduces those 18,000 words, right, that, which would indicate essentially 18,000 personality characteristics. But of course, many of those words are going to be just shades and tiny, uh, you know, have a, only a, a small difference from one to another uh, word. And as a result, uh, he recombines those words into 4,500 categories. Notice in this process, Allport does not eliminate any of the 18,000 words. What he does is he takes words that are very similar to each other and he kind of doubles them up, two or three words, and that forms a new category. So he still has the 18,000 descriptors, but he has just shrunk it down into 4,500 categories. Of course, 4,500 categories of personality is just too many for a human being to work with. Right? This is far exceeds your short-term memory, your working memory. You can't think in terms of 4,500 categories. So there has to be a better process to continue shrinking the number of possible personality categories down to a point at which a human scientist can understand it. But keep in mind, as you shrink the number of categories, each category gets broader and broader because you're not eliminating any of the descriptors that were originally found from that uh, original set of 18,000. You're simply shrinking the overall number of categories, which means that the number of words in each category just get added in there so that the categories become broader and broader, right? So it's an accordion effect. You shrink the number of categories and the number of category, uh, the size of the categories get larger. If you increase the number of categories, then the size of the categories can actually shrink. And that process has actually been kind of the backbone to a lot of the work in the trade approach ever since then. To be able to do this kind of work in a clear-cut scientific way using statistics, you fall back on the process of factor analysis tests that we talked about in the intelligence chapter. Factor analysis tests are, again, correlational tests which have no upper limit on the number of characteristics that you can add into the test itself. And in this case, you have essentially 18,000 possible uh, personality characteristics. So <clears throat> when you evaluate an individual for personality characteristics in group studies, you look for similar types of processes and you combine them into categories so that the correlation between the various associates become clustered together and you can shrink the number of categories down. But always remember the size of the categories continue to grow. One of the very first um, processes of the use of factor analysis to generate a, a personality test was Raymond Cattell's test. And Raymond Cattell wound up on 16 personality factors. He called it the Cattell's 16 personality factor model. Now, could Cattell have stopped at 15 factors or 17 factors or 10 factors or 22 factors? Sure. Of course he could have. He could have picked any other number of factors. In fact, the number of personality factors that he chooses largely is related to the number of categories that he decides to stop with in the end because this is just an accordion process. As time goes by, you use the uh, 16 personality factor model and evaluate how well it predicts behavior. Um, other other researchers come along and try uh, different approaches, uh, such as Hans Isink comes along with a three-factor model. Sixteen personality factors seems like too many. Three personality factors seems like too few. We're going to wind up on another category, but before we do, let's ask this question real fast. Is the number of personality characteristics theorists, 
theorists work with, more derived from the number they can understand rather than anything else? And of course, the answer there is yes, true. That absolutely is the case. Because personality is a construct and you're deciding how personality should look based upon the decisions of what you think a personality characteristic should be, you, as the human scientist, are actually determining how many personality characteristics would actually exist. On top of the fact that when you use a factor analysis test, you can shrink or expand the number of personality characteristics in your model to whatever number that you want to be. Of course, you want to use a model that's going to be as predictive for behavior as possible. And at the current time, the best model to predict behavior cross-culturally is the big five personality characteristics. Conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. Which you can use canoe as a uh, mnemonic technique because come your final exam, you're going to have to know the names of those five categories. Now what exists in each of those five categories? Each of those five categories is so large and confusing that the name of the category itself is not a very good descriptor of what's actually in there because there's so many things in there. So to actually talk about what is actually under conscientiousness is itself at least a chapter. And that's uh, well beyond uh, the kind of work we're going to do in a general psychology course. But I will show you a slightly closer view of what you have. Along the left side of this table, you'll see the big five characteristics from conscientiousness down to extroversion. But each of those categories has three primary subcategories. And each of those three primary subcategories exists on a continuum that are described by two words, such as disorganized and organized, or impulsive and disciplined, or uncooperative and helpful, and so forth. And if you were to take a personality test and have your personality test scored by the trait approach, you would have 15 dots spread across a chart that looks like the one you see on the screen right now. You could be highly disorganized, but very careful, very disciplined, but very ruthless. Uh, you could be in between suspicious and trusting and very uncooperative. You could be in between anxious and calm, and you could be moderately secure, moderately self-satisfied, but uh, low on practical. Um, and your, your range on these scales could hop all around. Now try to imagine 15 dots spread all over the course of that chart. Your results are handed to you, and you look at the psychologist and you say, what is the name of my personality? The psychologist is going to tell you there is no name, right? There, there is no particular name for every possible way that a personality test can play out because there are so many different combinations in which these numbers can play out over the course of those 15 subcategories. The only kinds of personality characteristics that you see named are ones that tend to be related to disorders, like narcissistic personality, or paranoid personality, or schizoid personality. But even in those characteristics, the range of possibilities is still fairly broad, so that if you looked at a big five range like this, you could not automatically recognize that somebody was paranoid or narcissistic based on the way in which the dots played themselves out. Uh, you're going to have to be very careful about it. It would not be immediately obvious by the way that these tests get um, scored. And that makes scoring personality tests very difficult and it also makes personality tests very poor predictors of human behavior. In fact, personality tests are consistently not used, 
okay? <laughs> and I, I know it's, it may sound funny, but they are almost never used specifically to predict the behavior of a person because they simply, at the current time, do not reach the standard to be able to accurately estimate how somebody's going to behave in the future. Which means that the field of personality, having started off in the 1800s from a standpoint that there was this global process inside your head that would generate a consistent personality characteristic, simply has not played itself out all the way up to 2020. You can't use personality tests to predict behavior very well. The use of personality tests is primarily existing in the realm of scientific work, where researchers are evaluating the personality characteristics that people have in relation to family lines to see if there is a possibility that there might be a heritable personality trait that you might see through family lines, whether or not personality traits change over the course of your lifespan based upon life experiences. So, you know, we talked about the trait approach and the social learning approach. How much can your environment change in extreme ways if, if your uh, country went into a civil war and you who used to own a flower shop now had to pick up a rifle and go kill people you didn't know just to protect yourself and your family? How would that affect your personality, right? Uh, to what degree would it remain part of you over time if this is something that you did when you were age 20? Would you still have those characteristics when you were age 70? Those are the kinds of questions people ask today regarding personality. But nobody is using a personality test to try to predict how somebody's going to act tomorrow. So let's take a look at this question. Given the previous description of how the Big Five test personality, do you think it's possible to easily explain a psychiatric patient's personality to another doctor? And the answer there would definitely be B. No, it would not be easy. In fact, it would be extremely difficult. If two psychiatrists were going to pass a patient between them, you would probably do better um, describing the individual in general rather than taking a personality test and handing it to the new psychologist at, to expect them to look at the results of the big five test to know what the personality was like and how they were going to behave. Uh, that simply wouldn't work. So there are some things here that uh, we should be very aware of. The big five traits tend to be relatively stable across your lifespan. In fact, they tend to become more stable as you age. Next, heritability appears to account for about 50% of their variability. This is an issue that even goes back to chapter three when we talked about nature and nurture. This is the current standard operating procedure story that is always given now from the field of psychology. As far as your development goes, about 50% of your variability is related to the environment and about 50% of your variability seems to be related to your genes. Your traits are tied to your emotional responding. That was an issue we dealt with also back in chapter three. The big five traits specifically do apply to across cultures. Um, in fact, this is one of the first tests that work very well across cultures. And it's one of the reasons why psychologists tend to focus on it. Because you can do personality tests in uh, North America, for example, and then you can take the similar types of tests and run them in China, South America, Africa, and in uh, various countries in these different continents and uh, evaluate similar types of personality characteristics in which people have been raised in entirely different cultures to evaluate the role of genes and environment and how they interplay to generate a personality trait. And some traits correlate well with other traits. There are things that tend to go together well. Uh, there are also other traits that tend not to, uh, not 
to go together well. Now, um, in the previous chapter, we had talked about savant level skills. In fact, we looked at a video of a woman who could memorize 2,000 songs in 25 separate languages, but had an IQ of 65. Uh, that was a movie on savantism. And uh, if you remember from the video, she had Williams syndrome. When Williams syndrome, apart from uh, being a form of intellectual disability, also influences personality characteristics. And this was actually true with the woman we saw in the uh, previous video, uh, but we're gonna dive into uh, the story of Williams syndrome and its role in uh, personality development a little bit more clearly here. We're at a picnic in La Jolla, California. At first glance, the kids here are like most kids. Certainly, they're high-spirited enough. But they're all linked by possessing a rare genetic disorder called Williams syndrome. Hello. Hi. Are you Scott? I'm Scott. How, How are, are you? Olga. So are you? Nice, nice to see nice you. Nice to meet you. How are you? You were the best in uh, Nash, I'll tell you that. Oh, you thank you. You were the best doctor in Nash I've ever seen. <laughs> Listen, I know you don't give up. Scott and Steve are 39-year-old identical twins, both with Williams syndrome. Is this Ursula? Yes, yes. Ursula. Hi, how are you? While Ursula Belugi is one of Scott and Steve's greatest fans. This is a special occasion. It certainly <laughs> is. Who's this? Okay. Ursula is one of a growing number of scientists fascinated by the Hello. extraordinary contradictions of Williams Syndrome. Hi, Mr. Alga. My name is Bestie, and I'm very, very glad that you're here and that you can spend some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's good to be here. Hi, we met the second. How are you? Uh, good. Hi. What's your name? I'm uh, Justin. Justin, hi, I'm glad to meet you. Hi, my name Only is... Only one in 25,000 children is born with Williams Syndrome. Hello. Its most characteristic physical feature is an appealing elfin face. On a social occasion like this, kids with Williams Syndrome are in their element. I'm Shannon. How are you, Shannon? I'm glad to meet you. to a really long, long time. Something that's so clear meeting these kids here today is how affectionate they are. That seems to be a typical personality attribute of these kids. Is that, is, am I right about that? Yeah, yes. I mean, I would say it's affectionate, it's interested in people, it's highly sociable, it's gravitating toward people. I mean, that's their thing in life. So it's, I think, affectionate and sociable. I'm going to ask you some questions that I'd like to answer. Mm -hmm. Justin, can you tell me how many months there are in a year? There's the 24 months in the year. Okay, good job. How old is the oldest woman on Earth? I don't know, probably 50. Okay. I don't know. How much does a compact car cost? A compact car? Um, Cars, by the way, are a favorite topic of Justin's. I'd say like 24,000. For thousand dollars, actually. What's the average salary per year for a doctor? Um, I would say eight forty-five. Uh, uh, I would say like eight dollars and forty-five cents per year. Yeah, per year. Okay, make your blocks look just like mine. This is the easiest one. Perhaps the most striking problem for people with Williams is performing visual spatial tasks. They can get the details right without seeing the overall picture. Your blocks look just like mine? Yes. All right. Show me a bicycle. Do you want to do that? Sir. I just drew my face, and I made sure I was at 10 speed and had brakes. Mm, nice. When we first came to the salt, we knew nothing about Williams syndrome, nothing about what caused nobody it. Nobody knew anything. And nobody nobody knew anything. And in such a short time, I'll never forget the day Ursula <laughs> laid down on the table in front of She put a picture of the gene, the chromosome, with the gene marked on it, and said, there it is. That's what caused it. Yeah. 
and I just cried. I just cried in such a short time for science to go from telling parents your child has Williams syndrome, that's all we know, to being able to say, here's the cause of it. The cause is literally visible under a microscope. When stained with a fluorescent dye, the chromosomes of a normal cell show a bright band in the middle of both copies of chromosome 7. In the cell of a person with Williams syndrome, only one copy of the chromosome has this band. The missing chunk contains only about 25 genes, so scientists are hoping to be able to trace not only the disabilities of people with Williams syndrome, but also some of their special strengths directly back to just a handful of genes. I mean, are you going to find out there's a gene for compassion? I mean, this is... This it, is let's call it sociability and... God damn it, you might. And what? You might. We might. You might? You think yes. you think you might actually be able to... I well, mean, that's, that's, that would be case, amazing. I mean, yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, I think that's sort of the hunt we're on. And I think it's... So you're, you're actually, <laughs> by, by studying carefully mm -hmm. what the roots of Williams syndrome are, mm -hmm. you're actually finding out what the roots uh, of qualities that all of us have are. Huh? I mean, you're beginning absolutely. to track down how we are who we are. I think that's put very, very well, and that is true. And the added fascination that we've got is that we can understand so much more about how the brain does it and how you get, can get in unusual ways to these strong qualities. Okay, now let's take a look at a question related to this video. Which characteristic personality is most stressed in the previous film clip? And that would be B, sociability. Williams syndrome is a syndrome in which there is an intellectual disability, but an increase in sociability amongst the individuals that have it. Our last video is related to biological aspects of personality. And in this case, uh, this video will talk about some of the underlying biochemical processes that are connected to brain function and personality. Some people get hooked on things like this. Whether she knew it or not, this parachutist was changing her chemistry, getting a rewarding rush of neurotransmitters. I love it! Oh, I feel like I can soar! Maybe it turned out to be so reinforcing that she jumped again and again until the sport became, in a sense, an addiction. If we could somehow have monitored the activity of her brain using positron emission tomography, the PET scan, during that jump, we might have seen something similar to the results Richard Heyer has been getting on the ground with people he calls sensation seekers, people who like to live life in the fast lane. There are some people with certain areas of their brains that have an unusually low metabolic rate. It's as if the cells there are just idling in situations where for the rest of us they'd be motoring along at full speed. And so those easily bored people tend to put themselves in situations where the idling cells can be sort of shifted into high gear. If you like rides like this and thrive on stimulation, your personality is probably very different from someone who enjoys nothing more than a quiet evening at home with a good book. And if your personality is different, chances are your brain chemistry is too. One way to find out is with a PET scan, which measures the activity of different areas of the brain. Blue areas show low activity, red shows high. You can see the dramatic difference from one day to the next in someone who cycles rapidly between depressions. These are PET scans made by Richard Heyer of two people with very different personalities. The one on the left is easily bored and the scan shows low activity. The one on the right with the red areas is quite active. According to preliminary studies by Dr. Heyer, 
the difference between the two seems to be related to a chemical, an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, or MAO. People with low levels of MAO are easily bored and tend to be sensation seekers. You could say they're action addicts. I think people believe that personality is largely the result of one's upbringing and one's environment. I'm beginning to think that may not be true. I'm beginning to think that personality may be very much biochemical, more biochemical than we imagine, and that variations in personality are the result of variations in brain chemistry. There may be some chemicals or some drugs that will be available to help people fine-tune their personalities, just like people now use drugs and medications to fine-tune their health. Okay. Now let's look at this question. The trade approach complements which of the following approaches? C, social learning. The trade approach and the social learning approach complement each other. They are essentially the personality models that are related to nature and nurture. And that concludes the chapter on personality.